Hello, Robert. Are you there? I'm here. All right. Great. A uh, little tech issue for a, sl a slight second there. Thank you so <laughs> much for uh, being patient and uh, joining me tonight. Uh, looking forward to actually speaking with you, and uh, hope your day was great so far. It was. Thank you so much. Hope yours was, too. Uh, not bad, not bad. Uh, sort of rained up here in uh, Toronto today. It was uh, much cooler than it has been uh, the last few days. It was almost summer-like. Today it was more spring-like, but uh, we may do and uh, try to make the best of it. But uh, I'm hoping uh, tonight, you know, we can have a great show because uh, it's a great topic. And uh, let's get uh, right into this. I mean, uh, you have an extension, extensive collection, but... Uh, it stems way before that and long before that. Uh, how did you stumble upon your first Ouija board, and uh, how scared were you when you had it in your hands on it? Well, um, you know, I've never been really scared of um, Ouija boards. Um, right. I, I was raised uh, Orthodox Jew, and um, anyone who's raised uh, Orthodox, any religion, I think is, you know, somewhat spiritual. Yes. And so I'm... Um, you know, kind of the belief that there are ghosts or that there are other things that are out there, it's just kind of, you know, kind of normal that that, that might be a possibility. And um, I, I kind of started getting fascinated with um, Ouija boards. 1986, the movie uh, Witchboard came out. And, yeah. um, you know, that was kind of like, oh, wow, you know, a whole movie dedicated to the subject. And, and then um, basically uh, I had some roommates that were rushing for a fraternity in college. And one of the things they needed to find was, um, like a treasure hunt kind of thing, was uh, uh, antique Ouija boards. So uh, I, I used to go antiquing with my dad all the time in uh, yard sales, flea markets. And so I went back home one weekend and, and picked up a few. And um, when I went to uh, leave college, I realized I had like 10 Ouija boards, and they, they were all different. And, uh, you know, I kind of thought there's only one. Ouija board, right? How could these all be yeah. different? And uh, that's right. that just started me, you know, on a 17-year kind of odyssey of collecting, researching, writing, uh, interviewing people to try to learn, you know, what the, the history is of this, you know, fascinating topic that scares the hell out of most people. <laughs> that's right. And uh, how, how did your family receive it? Because uh, as you said, uh, being Orthodox, uh, I'm half Greek, so I know all about the Orthodox as well. And... Uh, <laughs> But were they open to it? Because there is a lot of mysticism as well in the, the Hebrew culture uh, and religion as well. So were they open to it, or was it something they had to warm up to? Well, I just, you know, at first, I think it just thought it was, you know, a little strange. And um, um, and then, you know, as I started having like 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200, 300 Ouija boards, um, I think, you know, they were very – very early on thought, well, he's really obsessed with this. You know, this is strange because my collecting isn't just with um, Ouija boards. It's with all things Ouija related. Yeah. So I collect, like, and catalog every book, every music, you know, band, lyric, um, albums. Same thing goes with um, movies, TV shows. And, um, you know, I've hunted down the descendants of the people who kind of brought us the original Ouija board and... Um, so it's taken me all over. So I, yeah, I think it took them a time to warm up to the fact that it, it wasn't going to go away and that, you know, there was something more than just a, what a strange collection, you know. Uh, but, you know, today I, everyone's kind of, um, you know, I guess I'm the go-to guy if you have a question about Ouija boards. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of strange, but, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fun story. And uh, you just recently got married yourself. Uh, how does your spouse uh, receive this? Is, is he supportive of this? Or is he, you know, one of the type of people that kind of is just going along with it because uh, you're doing this as a full-time thing? Well, you know, um, it's, 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 I spend more time doing this than my actual job. So, right. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this little hobby obsession has uh, definitely taken over most of my time. But, um, I, you know, I've... Uh, I've been with my husband as about as long as I've been uh, collecting Ouija boards, maybe just a little bit less. So he's always known me as, you know, kind of being into this. So um, I don't. He doesn't think it's strange anymore. And you know, the house looks like a kind of a walking, a living museum because there are Ouija boards and covers everything everywhere, like every square inch of this place. So um, he's he's great. He's always been supportive of it, and uh, he's probably not as interested as in it as I am, but he knows a lot more than he ever thought he knew about Ouija boards, that's for sure. 
Well, that's awesome because uh, if you're ever out of the picture for any reason at that moment, uh, he could step in and uh, definitely uh, take your place for a short moment. <laughs> <laughs> he could. He could. <laughs> well, uh, let's let's talk about because uh, you've really gone in depth with this. I mean, right from the origins of the Ouija board itself, really from a mainstream point of view, uh, with the research of William Fold and. Uh, for people that might not know, also, even the word Ouija has a, a, a double meaning to it, too. It's, uh, it's actually French and German combined, and it's both the word yes. Um, did you find that going around and, and collecting all this data was, in essence, a yes, or was there a lot of negative uh, kind of roadblocks and uh, stumbling uh, sort of, you know, things that slowed your research progress? How did it go? Yeah, okay, you know, when I first started, when I first started uh, researching right away, um, I noticed that a lot of the research was contradictory. And you know, you think of something as kind of well known as the Ouija board, um, and it just seems strange. You know, I've never met a person who didn't know what it was. Yeah. There are some people who who maybe you know they don't they've never played with it, but they immediately know what it is and have kind of a strong reaction. You know, either. Older generation will say, "Oh my gosh, that's so that's so much fun! I used to play with it all the time." To you know, younger people who are like, "Oh my God, I would never have one of those in my house. That's the doorway to the devil." Um, and so the, I kept hitting, "How could this not be documented? I mean, why isn't this something everyone knows about? How come no one knows where it's from?" Um, and so yeah, one of the mysteries, early mysteries, is you know the actual name Ouija. There, there are two main uh, ideas about what it what it means. One of them um, is an early one, Charles Kennard, um, who the original company was named after, the Kennard Novelty Company from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, supposedly, he sat down with his fiance, asked the board what it wanted to be called, and it spelled out Ouija. That was one of the first kind of legends to come out of this. And then uh, William Fold would later. Um, he was uh, basically an employee in the original company who quickly, within a year, um, was put in charge of the whole thing. And then he would go on and his family to um, sell Ouija boards from 1890 to 1966 when they sold it to Parker Brothers. And um, he would later say that the um, Ouija was actually the combination of two words, we and yeah, yes, yes board, so that the board would always answer. So to be honest with you, there there is no documented proof as to what it is. And uh, William Fold was a master um, marketer, and he basically took everything he sold, and you know, Ouija board being one of them, turned them into number one selling games. So he knew that one of the tricks to this was to constantly change your story. And uh, you know, if you had a different audience, you'd, you'd change the story up and, and retell it. And he did that a few times. So. Um, to date, we just we don't know where the word really comes from. Originally, it was marketed as Ouija, the Egyptian luck board, um, and people would say, "Oh, well, it meant you know, um, it, it was Egyptian for you know, kind of the uh, Egyptian luck board." But that's not true, you know. Right. So um, it was just kind of a lot of legend, um, and we call them Ouija stitions. So there, there are a lot of things. Do you know when uh, the exact uh, first uh, found? Ouija board was created. Is there any proof of, of an actual date of that? Well, yeah, you know, um, there's a lot of um, a lot of kind of false information on this, and uh, part of it uh, is because a 1920 um, occult encyclopedia said that uh, Ouija boards were used around you know 540 BC, the time of Pythagoras. It, it's not true. There's no documentation of that. Of, and right. so basically, well, Ouija is a trademark on what a class of games called talking boards. So a Ouija board is a talking board. It's much like um, Kleenex. You say, pass me a Kleenex. You really mean tissue. Kleenex is a um, trademark. And Xerox, yeah, I made a Xerox copy. Xerox is really a trademark. You really mean like a photocopy. So um, Ouija was the first trademark of these talking boards and obviously has remained the most um, popular. And it's still trademarked today. Um, so the first talking board that we know of um, was in 1886. We have an article saying the the new planchette, the talking board, sweeps Ohio. And so, and, and they describe it and actually have pictures drawn in this article from the New York Tribune in 1886 uh, showing this this new kind of fangled planchette. And um, the reason they call it the new planchette is because uh, you know the movable piece to a Ouija board. We call a planchette, but the planchette 
predates the Ouija board. Um, in the early 1800s, this spiritual, spiritualistic device to contact uh, the other side, it was basically a much bigger table than we see as the planchette, but um, it would have two rollers for feet at the, the thicker side and the bottom, and then at the top, the tip, where there would normally be a hole, there was a small hole for a pencil, and that would become the third leg, and they would put their hands on it and ask a question and write out the answer. So they, people saw this as an extension of something that was already there. And so um, 1886, we, we see these articles, these homemade talking boards were, were kind of um, being homegrown. And then um, February 10, 1891, the first patent um, by Elijah Bond was granted on the talking board, which they named Ouija. That's very interesting. And uh, do you have, in your opinion, uh, the best type of planchette? Because as you spoke of, this one was massive, but uh, in the miniature version, uh, some people prefer the crystal. Some people, mm -hmm. they use the, just the ordinary plastic one. But um, from your research, is there something that really, you know, definitely is superior to the other? Well, I think, um, you know, Ouija boards, tend to, if you look at the artwork, let's say, yes. on Ouija boards, um, they tend to reflect the decade that they're made in. So right. popular, you know, so 1920s, um, 1940s, you see like Swamis, um, you know, Egypt, anytime what's seen as mystical at the time. So I haven't found a shape or design for people to work better. It tends to be whatever, if the shape or design or uh, artwork kind of um, hits them, it makes them kind of think, okay, this is, you know, really cool, or they just connect to it somehow. So I haven't, it, it always changes. I, I think that's the fun part about the Ouija board, that even the, you know, designs change to match the times. I think there was, today, um, uh, Shannon Sylvia, she uh, patented the iWay planchette, which is an electronic version yes. of the planchette, which goes to show people, you know, kind of where you put pressure and to kind of see if someone's cheating or whether there's a spirit doing it. So even today, you know, uh, Ouija boards have made their way into the uh, electronic digital world. And that's something we'll get into as well for future uh, forms of Ouija. But uh, do, you have, do you have any uh, uh, sort of stance or, or thought on, uh, most of them are made out of wood, and uh, is there a quality of wood uh, that, uh, again, amplifies the experience of the users, or does it depend on the state of mind of the person uh, there? Yeah, I think it's the state of mind. You know, and I'll just um, go on record real early. You know, I have, like, um, at this time, I have about 500 different boards and then duplicates of all of them. And, and yeah. you know, honestly, they're all here. They're all in my house. And um, the doorway to hell has never opened up. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I, I'd be selling tickets. You might be, you know, maybe you'd be in line um, to see this place if it was. But, you know, I, I say that as a joke, but seriously, um, I, you know, I don't find Ouija boards to be bad things. And I, I don't think that Ouija boards are, um, there's anything more mystical about them than any other, you know, um, communication device you're using to make contact with, um, you know, spirits. And, and the reason I say that is they're just basically a piece of wood or a piece of cardboard or paper with letters and numbers on it. I think... Um, what, what gives the Ouija board its power is that, you know, for, for 120 years, the Ouija board is 120 this year. And so um, for 120 years, it's been so ingrained in our pop culture as, as to what these are, um, the expectation is pretty high. So when you bring out a Ouija board, everyone immediately knows what you're supposed to do. You don't have to explain someone the directions. You know, they just, they know because they've seen movies and stories and um you know, TV shows. So it, there's power in that, but the actual device itself, you know, you kind of remember, you and I are talking on the phone right now, and, and we have people listening, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the phone is just a device to help us communicate. So the real conversation, the real power, the real substance is happening between you and I. Um, and we don't really think much about the phone in this, kind of like, okay, we use the phone. But with the Ouija board, for some reason, we talk to spirits and the conversation goes badly, and all of a sudden the Ouija board is at fault. It's the bad Ouija board. It's really awful. I mean, you know, if you and I had a bad conversation, I wouldn't, like, hang up the phone and, you know, talk about how bad the phone was and throw my phone out the window and say, I'm never going to use this phone again. It just doesn't happen. But it's, it's unique because in the Ouija board, um, it, the Ouija board takes a lot of this, negativity, anything goes wrong, people kind of forget you're making the communication, that 
you know, if there's an ability to speak with the dead, it's coming from you, not from anything else. The, the board is just a means to that end. So, you know, a, a question, and I'm sure you'll you know want to hit this later, but you know, it's been brought to my attention many times that a lot of uh, ghost hunters or, or people who are um, investigating uh, a haunting, first question they ask is, oh, did anyone use a Ouija board? And and um, then they run around with their K2 meters, right, and um, ask the same questions they ask a Ouija board. Is there anyone here? You know, it, does it blink? Are you male or female? Does it blink? Does it? And for somehow, some reason, the technology we use today makes people feel a little more separate and safer than using a Ouija board, which they have to put their hands on. It's very simple. It's very quiet. It's very intense. You know, with um, EVPs, you don't know what you're getting until you kind of, you know, hours later go back and then go over the data, whereas a Ouija board, you're getting, like, an immediate answer. So I, I think it, it makes people feel uh, kind of this, to me, a false sense of, of um, it kind of sanitizes the experience, you know, whereas a Ouija board, I, I think, is very... Uh, visceral, you know, you, you're feeling it. You, you, you know, you can feel the thing moving. You're watching it happen. Um, it's right. kind of scary. Whereas, again, you know, watching a K2 meter blip doesn't seem all that scary. No, you're, but, you're, but I don't you're think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Cause it, it, and if you put it into this perspective too, uh, if a machine says something there, you don't have to worry about yourself creating and you know invoking that experience. It's a machine that's causing it. Whereas if it's yourself and you're afraid of these sort of things, you know what I mean? It's going to cause you to have a, a bad reaction to it. Exactly. And, you know, it, you're, like you're telling, you know, the other thing people say, well, it's different because with the K2 meter you can put it down and you can ask it. In a Ouija board, you have to put your hands on it. And, um, and so, you know, the question is when you're using the Ouija board, um, you know, it, is, it, is this entity coming through you to push it? So it's you pushing it, but it's the spirit kind of taking over your hands or – is this spirit pushing the planchette in a different place, and you're just kind of, you know, going along for the ride? So it, yeah. I mean, it even matters what you, I think, believe is happening, you know, or or is it simply what scientists would call automatism? Um, and is it your subconscious actually just answering the questions? And that's what makes the Ouija board so fun, you know. 120 years later, we're all still talking about why it might be working. Yeah, and, and there's also another connective thing here as well. If you have uh, a Ouija board and there's you know, uh, minimum three, uh, as many as six or seven people all touching it at the same time, you have, you know, that unique mass consciousness connection uh, throughout the, those seven people maximum or whatever amount of people would be there. And that's something to to look at as well because it's almost telepathy at its minimal, you know, like its minor, most minor point. And uh, that's pretty encouraging as well. Yeah, it is, and it, it, you're exactly right. Is it? There, is there some kind of psychic telepathy going on there? And yeah. and because the Ouija board is so basic and so primal, does it does it put us in a place to either make contact with this you know part of our brain that allows us to communicate with, whether it's with spirits or whether it's e each other on kind of a nonverbal level? And that that is kind of you know it's kind of it, again you know 120 years later you, you think of you know people used to use spirit horns um, in different mediums, and all of these things are so long gone, and, you know, uh, the Ovilus, when it first came out, was this huge thing, and, you know, it's already moved on, we're already past that, and and yet the Ouija board, you know, one of these original ghost hunting tools, you know, it, it's still around. And if you look at it, too, it's also a, a low-tech version of an EVP uh, mm -hmm. reader, you know, you have, instead of a radio, you have humans transmitting and and receiving this information from above and beyond or, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, that's something that uh, I think is probably forgotten as well, especially with all the high-tech gadgets that we're using these days, as you were saying. Exactly. It was the first text messenger. That's you right. know, before, before your iPhone or your BlackBerry, you had the uh, that's right. Sweet Tooth. <laughs> and uh, there was something I wanted to ask you. Uh, do, do you suggest or have you ever used uh, the Ouija board alone because uh, I've heard superstitious stories, uh, legends, myths, you know, that if you uh, especially use it by yourself, then that's when the worst can happen. Uh, do you know anything about that or is that just, um, you know, just uh, an old wife tale or, or urban myth of that sort of thing? Well, it is, you know, these, that's what we call these the urban legends that have to do with Ouija boards we call Ouija-stitions. Um, yeah. And 
you know, and because they, they tend to be very unique to the Ouija board. Um, and I'll tell you something. We'll start off as if you think back and, and we look at these early covers, like whether it's a Norman Rockwell cover uh, for the Saturday Evening Post in 1920 where he did a couple playing the Ouija board. So for people who think it's evil, and you know what the Saturday Evening Post is, not the most evil magazine. You know, it's kind of like Americana at its best. Um, and then you have kind of the first cover of um, the first kind of artwork that we see uh, in 1901, and it's a couple playing a Ouija board in front of a fire. And if you think back to like late 1800s, early 1900s, men and women were not allowed um, to be alone together on a date. And they certainly weren't allowed to just be sitting there in the dark with a candle or the fire going, having being knee to knees touching and then their hands touching on something. So the original directions were really smart. And, and again, William Fold's smart marketer was, you know, to get the best results, it should be a man and a woman. Well, you know, yeah, I'm sure a lot of guys love Ouija board dates. Like this was a huge phenomenon from like yeah. the 1890s to the 1920s because all of a sudden they got to break like every rule of the time as far as what was supposed to go on between men and women. And, um, and you see this in countless, countless um, illustrations leading through the 1920s. And um, so now what comes out of that is, oh, you shouldn't play it alone. You know, you should always play it with someone. Um, and so you can kind of see like, okay, yeah, because, you know, guys are using this as day tools um, for what was popular at the time. And then, you know, the other thing is, is originally in the, up till the 1890s, if you wanted to have a seance, you had to find an experienced medium. And that costs money. You know, not, a, not everyone around had money where they could get a medium to come in. But then you had something, you know, in 1890 that was sold for a dollar to a dollar fifty, and you could kind of do something similar yourself. Uh, and, and what it did was it, it, it put a lot of mediums at the time um, kind of got their nose out of joint because they were losing significant amount of business. And um, actually a lot of these we justitians or rumors were originally spread by the spiritualist group itself from people who just thought, well, no, no, you don't want to use a Ouija board. Anything could happen. You don't know who's going to answer the phone on the other side. You want me, an experienced medium, who can direct you through this spirit world. And so it, it became really funny because some of the worst things said about the Ouija board started from the very community that, you know, originally started using it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, since, uh, yeah, they were having a, a witch hunt within the occult, and uh, that's, that's yeah. absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and so so I have, yeah, you know, look, there have been millions of Ouija boards sold. And like anything else, the more you sell, the bigger of a chance someone's going to have a bad experience with it. Um, and I will tell you, uh, as part of my research, I've called up the top 10 uh, medical facilities in the United States. And the top 10 um, kind of psychological uh, institutions as well. And I, I ask them the same question, okay, and is uh, in the – in one, five, ten, and twenty-five years, can you tell me how many cases that someone was admitted to the hospital or was harmed by Ouija board use? And you know, the first thing I get is this person on the phone starts laughing at me, like, "Is this a joke?" No, no. I go through the whole thing as to why I'm asking it. None of those ten, none of them. There has been no person admitted in those times. So the data seems to point separately from what we hear of these urban legends, which are all of these horrible things that have happened. In fact, the most popular case, or, or what made um, people really scared of the Ouija board, um, was um, you know, kind of the exorcist case, the original case that the movie was put on. And um, I've talked to the researchers in that case, and they cannot verify that there really was ever any Ouija use in that case. It was something that kind of came up later, but no one's been able to verify it, even with um, you know, friends and family of the original uh, boy that was involved in it. So, I, you know, what happened basically to the Ouija board was um, it was seen as, as uh, an amusement, a toy, um, up until really um, get into like the 1960s, 1970s, when Hollywood kind of got a hold of it and started using it as a, a visual tool for possession. And once that happened, it's just every movie afterwards has basically seen it that way. So then, of course, we see that, and, uh, you know, it's kind of in our culture. And that's why when I interview someone who's 90 years old, they just love to see the Ouija board, and they tell the greatest fun stories that they've told, you know, that, that I've heard. They're always from an older person. And then 
you talk to someone you know in their 30s um, and younger, and it's just like, oh my God, get that out of my house. So it, it, it is actually a, kind of a newer phenomenon about how horrible the Ouija board is. It's not to say that people haven't been having bad experiences from the beginning. I mean, you know, if you um, you know, it, I think you bring with the Ouija board, um, you know, if you've got bad karma and and you maybe have some um, some issues, maybe mental issues or drug issues or whatever is going on. I think we, it is it, shown that you know the Ouija board are dabbling in anything um, that kind of amplifies those type of things. You're probably willing to you know you're going to see a little more strange things. That's um, and, and do you yeah. feel that uh, uh, sorry to cut you off uh, that uh, uh, remote viewing is uh, ref a refined version of the Ouija board? Uh, it has a lot of similarities to it, but. Uh, you know, you're not using the board itself, but you're using the same almost principles. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, all of that stuff um, is somewhat related because I, I think it all, like you said, one, there's there are a lot of similarities, and, and two, I think they're tapping into that part of the brain that I just don't think we understand, you know, um, and it puts you in that place where potentially you can't, I mean, I, I think if you can if you can talk to a ghost, then of course you can talk to them through the Ouija board. You know, I just, you know, my own hope is that, you know, you can talk to them lots of different ways, and that when I go, I don't have to wait for someone to pick up the Ouija board because they are not necessarily as popular as they used to be. So I don't want to have to wait. <laughs> but um, yeah. I, um, but I, I think yeah, you know, I think there's all there are a lot of practices um, that people use to make contact that are are really just spin off So many of the tools and the way that we try to make contact today in investigations, they're all just cousins and descendants of the Ouija board. And again, I think because it's technology, it sanitizes that. But if you're in danger um, because you don't know who you're going to get on the other line, it's, it's just a common thing that I hear. People say, oh, I'd never use a Ouija board because you just never know what you're inviting in. And then I listen to those same questions, again, like with a K2 meter or EVP or whatever tool they want to use. And I laugh because ultimately I think the when you invite something in is when you're trying to make contact. I don't necessarily think it matters what you use. But I don't think it, I think, again, if there's power in, in a Ouija board, why does it maybe work better than other things or, or not work as well? I, I just think it's been around for so long. And again, our, our brains have this huge expectation as to what happens when you sit down with a Ouija board. But, um, you know, with a K2 meter, you could, I couldn't just throw it at you and say, if you've never seen one here, make it work. You'd have no idea what to do with it. Um, right. You know, or but you know, if I throw a Ouija board at you, you might actually kind of like shy away from it. So well, well, there's um, also the principle too. If, if you keep things simple, sometimes it works better than if you have you know millions of gadgets all around you and in every direction around you. Uh, because think about a, a spirit. If you walk into a room as a spirit from their perspective for a second here, and you see nothing but these weird machines, especially if some of them are from like the 17, 1800s. They're not going to know what those are. They're going to be freaked out themselves, right? So they may not appear to you as easily as if they just see a piece of wood on the table. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something to that's consider. Good. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, again, because they've been around so long, and you know, most, um, you know, anyone who was around, you know, after the 1800s um, to today would know, you know, what a Ouija board is. That's for sure. So uh, yeah, I think there is there's power in that, and and there's power in the brand. I mean, Canada also interestingly enough has its very own history to the Ouija board. It, um, uh, the the international rights were sold um, really early on by 1892 um, to a company called Cop Clark, which was a huge game company um, in Canada. And uh, today, uh, that all those rights and different things were sold to Papa's Toys. And Papa's Toys today makes the Ouija board in Canada, whereas Parker Brothers, um, owned by Hasbro, makes the uh, the Ouija board in the U.S. Right. So yeah, I spent uh, a lot of time in Canada you know, researching and, uh, in Toronto. And uh, do you find that uh, because Parker Brothers, Hasbro, or even uh, various other toy companies uh, have their logos on these boards that for somebody that is a skeptic, if they see that, is that an automatic, like, you know, like uh, in the Family Feud game where that big X comes on the screen? <laughs> right. I, do, I, I think um, 
I think that you know does it kind of, does it make people like you mean uh, think they don't work because it's like a yeah it's, or, or that it's like a real joke or you know that it's it's not uh, in any way shape form real. Yeah, you know, I again they were originally sold and marketed as amusement, and and the whole yeah. family would sit down and play these boards. So um, you know, it makes sense that they're can, it's they're uh, also one of the only games that's been continually sold on the shelves of toy stores for 120 years. So yeah, I think to, to people who who believe you're really talking to a spirit, and there's no question that this is uh, spirit communication. Yeah, I think they look at it and think, geez, that, that really dumbs it down. Um, you know, it, it's cardboard and plastic today. It used yeah. to be wood. Um, and you can see a logo on it. But at the same time, um, I think what makes the Ouija board so popular is that they are so mass-produced. And you know, again, something you can make yourself. Some people claim that they work better if you make it yourself because you know, you're putting the time into it, you're putting your energy into it. Um, other people say, no, 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 the, the older ones work better. Um, the other people will tell you, no, you should never use a board that's been touched by anyone else like a crystal. You should have your own board. No one should else should touch it. It should just be yours. So buying a brand new one is the best thing. And you know, again, it's all personal preference because um, I think if you believe an old one's going to work better, I guarantee you, for you, an old one's going to work better. Um, well, well let me ask you: How, how many uh, of these boards do you actually own? Is it uh, 300 plus, or uh, are you getting closer I, to 400? <laughs> no, I probably have about 500 now. Um, Five, of these wow. Different and then I have duplicates of those, so there there are, oh, God, it, I would say I have duplicates of most of them, so it's got to be close to probably like eight or 900 of, um, you know, of, with duplicates um, of some of them. And, um, yeah, they're, I, I, they're amazing to track through time because, like I said, every generation uh, kind of rediscovers the Ouija board. That's, that's the fun thing about it is that... Um, What's interesting today is when I do these conferences, um, you know, it, it's a lot of um, convincing people or the organizers or the actual ghost investigators that they don't want to have anything to do with them. They've just kind of grown up in a generation where they're bad. Usually after I'm done, you know, taking them through time, this kind of multimedia presentation I do, it's kind of a different respect for it. And, and in the end, I usually end up bringing a lot of new Ouija boards for people to kind of break out and use in their investigations alongside the K2 meter and uh, their EVP devices. So, um, you know, it's kind of well, neat to a, see. Here's a, sorry, here's a question. Have you ever had, uh, at one moment, uh, say, because you have almost 1,000, so there would be 1,000 individuals using your boards uh, at one time. Would you consider trying that as an experiment to see what might happen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, Brad, I'd love to see people playing the Ouija boards. I, and especially the old ones, I tend to bring... Um, um, you know, I usually set up like a little mini museum and then pass them around so people can actually touch them and feel them and see what, yes. you know, the differences of them to today. Yeah, I think it's great. And again, I, I don't, I have heard some really awful, horrible stories, but I will tell you that most of the stories I hear about Ouija board use are usually, oh, I heard this story from so-and-so or my cousin. Yeah. It's not usually from the individual who's had the bad experience. Right. Um, and, you know, and you, and any researcher knows, any good investigator knows, you, you do you know, you, you take all the data, so if someone tells you something, but you have to take it with a grain of salt unless you can absolutely substantiate it. And, the, and a lot of stories of Ouija boards are just that, stories. And, uh, you know, it leads itself to, it, it's kind of mystique. That's the mystifying oracle, you know. That's right. And uh, would you have a reference to which country uses uh, the Ouija the most? Would it be, you know, United States or Canada or is that something that you haven't uh, checked into yet for stats? Yeah, no, I, I track them all over. Um, you know, the um, the Ouija board was it was an American invention or you know Western invention, and um, so more of the use it, it seems its huge popularity originally seemed to be um, you know U.S. and Canada and Mexico. It's really big in Mexico. That was more of an '80s thing. It looks like from right. my um, it kind of boomed in the '80s for for Mexico. Um, it, what we're seeing now, um, a form of the Ouija board, uh, in J a Japanese form, is called Kokori. Um, and in probably about the 90s to today, you see tons of Japanese um, or Asian movies, Korean movies, using forms of um, the Ouija board in their films. So, you know, again, because it's a great visual way to show that something supernatural is happening, um, there's a, a big boom in Ouija boards in Asia. 
which is really unique because that's just it's not happening at the same time or through the same way as it is here. So I would say, yeah, it, it's definitely more Western U.S., Canada, um, Mexico, and, and again, you do see the Ouija boards were bought and sold and, and um, in. London and um, different places, Spain, but they've never had the same popularity because it, it was kind of a, a latecomer to the spiritualist movement as far as Europe is concerned. They've kind of already passed a lot of those things. So it's there. Um, they tended to stick with the planchette. The planchette stayed. They, they would add a piece of paper to their big planchette and would have the letters and numbers on it. So you could just turn your pencil over, use the eraser at the other end, and it would point out the letters. So to them, it kind of, for some reason, the planchette stuck. Or is it replaced it pretty quickly here in the U.S. and Canada? Right. And uh, would you consider, or is there something like this already, uh, putting together like a traveling antique road show uh, for Ouija or talking boards? You know, that's what I, I, I try to do that um, in my um, with the different conferences I go to. I, I bring right. a, a little museum and set it up, and uh, you know, get people psyched about the talk, and um, just you know, get people to kind of get over their initial fears of, you know, some people won't go anywhere near it when I set it up. <laughs> and then there are other people who are just, you know, completely drawn to it. And uh, um, so, yeah, that's, it, it's my goal. In, in, in the end, I would like to see, um, you know, a museum kind of a physical location set up just on the Ouija and talking boards. And um, I've been working with a museum in um, the uh, Baltimore Museum of Industry in, um, in Baltimore, Maryland, where, you know, birth of the Ouija board to kind of set up a, a, an exhibit, which would be the first one in the country. There's really no exhibit dedicated to the Ouija board. And, and again, it, it's kind of the uh, granddaddy of all of uh, all of these uh, tools, and yet there's no one place for them. So I'd yeah, love to see That would be absolutely it. great, and uh, a definite benefit for, uh, for, for most people that are into the Ouija board itself. And uh, would you uh, have any suggestions? I just thought of something. If somebody was digging through their, you know, grandparents' basement or something like that, and they came across uh, an antique uh, Ouija or talking board. Uh, would you want them to contact you and sort of uh, bring it to you, or do you, do you suggest the person hold on to them, the item themselves, and sort of do what they would with it? Yeah, well, you know, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I spend a lot, a couple hours every night going through emails. Um, because I have two websites, right? One for just myself, it's uh, robertmerch.com, and then the other um, where it's basically the entire history um, of the Ouija board, some kind of the most detailed um, research on the Internet, and it's um, williamfoldfuld.com. And, um, you know, yeah, you can contact me through them, and that's what most people do. They, they tell me they have a board. You know, I ask them to send me pictures, and I help them identify which one it is, um, and if they're interested in selling it or getting rid of it. or You know, I've had people just mail me Ouija boards because they don't want they want it out of their house. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, yeah. And then I've had other people who um, you know really excited to sell it or just were, were really excited to find a piece of history and, and then they keep it and and hang it up on their wall. So um, you know I'm always happy to help. That's how I found so much of the research is with people who actually you know have them. So there are some boards that I've only seen in pictures even after having you know 500 of them. And uh, is there value to these pieces, or, or is it uh, still a market that's growing? Yeah, it, it's definitely still a market that's growing. But, uh, you know, for instance, um, 1933, the William Fold Company made an electric version of the Ouija board. So you're thinking, wow, 1933, electric version. I mean, it was way ahead of its time. Um, it, was a, it was a big sheet of kind of uh, cast iron, uh, well, like, and it, it kind of had a baked enamel on it, and it would have these kind of protrusions that would stick up. And then the planchette itself was much bigger and it had a light bulb underneath it and had a battery in it. And as it, as it touched these protrusions, it would complete the circuit and light would come on and you'd be able to use this in the dark. And, you know, again, the problem is um, you're talking like World War II time and, um, you know, they were sold for 350 and people couldn't afford it. They were going through, like, the Depression. And um, most of them were uh, melted down for scrap metal. And um, there are very few of them that survived. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have um, one in my collection. And I watched on eBay one go, and it went for, um, you know, uh, let's see, there's one went for $2,500, and the other one went for about $5,000. Wow. So there's, depending on the, the, depending on the age and the rarity 
of um, the board, they can go for a lot of money. And then, you know, I picked um, some of the most rare ones up for 2 and $10 and um, had to pay $200 for ones that people just have gotten the idea that they're, uh, they're valuable. So, you know, eBay is a great place to see them. And if you're really good and, you know, you, you snag it before someone else sees it, it's a great place. But unfortunately, it, it'll, uh, it'll take a lot of your money too. I've spent a, definitely a small fortune on these boards. <laughs> in the long run, though, you'll have a legacy, you know, and uh, that's definitely uh, something that has uh, no price tag to it. And, uh, yeah, you're right. You have, a, the, uh, you have a piece with you that uh, has a, a sort of a, a story with it that uh, is, your, like, your main centerpiece that you showcase besides that electric one. Yeah, you know, um, I also, I'm sitting here in my office, and um, I got to become pretty good friends of the um, the Fold family. And um, yeah. Kathy Fold, the granddaughter of William Fold, was um, became a very good friend of mine through doing the research together, really. She was wonderful. You know, she had a lot of this stuff and um, kind of opened her house and her family to me. And she gave me a lot of um, the original photographs of William Fold sitting in front of a Ouija board that used to hang in his, uh, his office, along with his uh, children and different um, descendants that took over the business. And so all of these family photos of them playing the Ouija board kind of surround me in my office, um, as well as um, the other side of the family, um, William Fold's brother, Isaac Fold, who they were involved in a feud for many years. Um, they gave me one of the uh, the original stencils so that they used to make the Ouija board. So wow. there's a lot of things. I don't think there's anything, uh, there's any one thing. I love the photographs. I love seeing uh, the faces behind the people who, who started this. And um, and then, uh, you know, some of the early boards, that uh, uh, Charles Kennard, uh, after he was kind of um, pushed out of the company, he went on to make uh, a couple of other boards, um, a Volo board and the Esperito board, um, uh, the um, let's see, Volo, the Esperito board um, by the company, by the Reed company, and then um, the Italy board. So I, I tend to like the earlier boards. It's kind of my um, passion is to really get down to the roots. But yeah, I don't know. They, I love them all. They're all unique. It's like having kids, you know. You don't love anyone more, but you love them all differently. <laughs> and uh, have you ever heard of the absolute haunted board? Uh, is there such a thing out there? you know, like the, the creme de la creme of, of boards? Yeah, I think there are, um, in, in some pretty popular hauntings um, that claim to use a, a Ouija board, those particular boards um, tend to be the ones, people still try to find um, the original witch board, and I'll tell you, there is a, um, I hunted it down a couple years ago, um, Witch Board 3 was filmed in Montreal, um, and there is a shop in Montreal that actually has that kind of really cool, dark, evilly looking board. It is the board that was used in the movie. They were given it to um, by the producers and the filmmakers after they provided the, uh, the set with a lot of um, new age and occult, you know, props. Um, they gave them that, that board. So um, the, the witch boards from the witch board series one, two, and three, they tend to be pretty sought after. Um, because, you know, people see them in the movies, and it was a scary movie, and yeah. I think personally the scariest part of Witchboard was the 80s hairdos, but that's just me. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And the music. <laughs> and the music is pretty bad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. But uh, I, I'm wondering if, uh, cause you said you uh, spoke to Kathy Fold and you're good friends with the family. Were they believers of the paranormal in any way, or was it, you know, more or less like a business uh, yeah, you know, to them, um, Kathy always, um, she always tells a story about how when I first interviewed her, um, I said, well, you know, what was it like growing up in the family that, you know, made the Ouija port? And she laughed and she said, you know, I never really thought of it. You know, it's like um, they played Monopoly and Partizi and Scrabble growing up. And to them, the Ouija board was just what was, you know, putting, you know, food on the table. And, um you know, so to them, you know, no, it's a fun game and it, it's great. And, um, it, you know, they play it. Kathy's played it, you know, many times and it works well for her. And But it was just, uh, you know, kind of the business. And, um, you know, granted, it's a pretty unique, fun business, you know, to be in when you look back at it. And, uh, you know, it's, she's helped me do the research. Um, 
you know, it's been fascinating. It's kind of a neat family heritage. You know, the Fold family has uh, definitely, you know, making Ouija boards from 1890 to 1966 and having uh, three generations really be involved in the business, that's a, that's a pretty unique legacy um, for, for them. And then, um, you know, uh, to have the um, kind of where I got involved w with this is in um, 19, um, 1997, um, trying to think of 1996, I started a, um, a website um, where I, I put up all of these Ouija boards and, and different things to kind of like a little faux museum. And uh, Kathy actually signed my guest book online saying that she was the granddaughter of William Fold. And about a week later, um, Stuart Fold, who is the grandson of Isaac Fold, William's brother in the business, yeah. um, he, he wrote me as well. And so um, basically what happened was uh, in 1897, uh, Isaac William Fold had been in this business since 1890. He brought his brother into the business, um, Isaac, and they worked together from 1897 to 1901. And um, in 1901, um, Isaac was removed from the business, and a huge family feud broke out um, over who had the right to make Ouija boards. And Isaac tried to make them. He had court orders to stop. This went in court from um, 1901 to 1920. The two sides would fight. So these very close brothers were kind of um, ripped apart by the Ouija board. Isaac would go on to make um, Oriole boards, and of course, you know the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles are, is also the um, the state bird of um, Maryland. So um, he called them Oriole boards. And in, in 1920, in the end, when the last court case went in there, it found that Isaac had uh, broken. Uh, the law by making these, you know, against the court's wishes and um, that William was entitled and uh, was the only person who could make Ouija boards because he owned the trademark and patents on it. Um, so the two sides, the two, this family, very close family, was split and didn't talk um, from after 1901. Um, and then both of them, here we got, you know, you've got like, you know, 100 years later in, in um, 1996, 1997, they're both talking to me and um, and then they were both asking questions about the other side of the family. And, um, you know, I, I finally uh, just gave Kathy Stewart's number and said, you know, you're asking me questions and this is, you know, this is a family member of yours and he probably could help you better. And uh, she actually called him up. And then um, that summer in, in 1997, uh, they had the first uh, full family reunion in 100 years where the two sides buried the hatchet. And... Um, you know, got back together because of it. So it's kind of weird the Ouija board kind of broke this family apart, and then it was the Ouija board that brought them back together again. Yeah, and so, also and at the same time, you were the center pin that, uh, uh, you know, created the bond and and uh, brought these people back together too. So <laughs> everything well, I, happens for a reason. Well, <laughs> it, it does. I, I have – it was it was a great – it was really neat because the family are, are wonderful people. Um, you know, uh, both sides of the family are, are, are fantastic and have been wonderful to me. Um and wonderful to preserving the legacy of the Ouija board. So, um, and then uh, recently, I was um, I was looking for uh, Elijah Bond, the man who first patented the Ouija board's grave, because I, I can find the descendants by going through cemetery records better. And uh, I found, finally found where he was buried. And uh, in a week after that, I located a descendant of his um, his great grandniece actually, and his um, great. Uh, his great, I think, grandnephew was 99 years old when I talked to him, and he remembered Elijah Bond. So I got to talk to him, and he gave me permission um, to put in a gravestone because this was an unmarked grave. So we raised money from different Ouija collectors and people who were involved. We put in this huge monument, um, and on the back of it is uh, Elijah Bond's drawing in the patent of the Ouija board. So kind of got to thank him for all these years of fun as well. That's absolutely amazing how it all works out in the end. Yeah, it does. It does. And then um, just uh, last year, we were lucky enough to get uh, William Fold's big factory that uh, pumped out so many Ouija boards starting in the 1920s. Um, we made a uh, uh, Baltimore City landmark. It was designated by the mayor. So to so finally get the city to kind of preserve its own history. That's right. And uh, where do you see the future uh, of uh, the Ouija? I, I know you spoke of... Uh, and Sylvia, but uh, it, it, do you think the ultimate end of this would be an implantable uh, sort of planchette in, underneath the skin? Uh, well, you know, the I, brain? I, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes, like I said, because, um, 
you know, Hasbro is actually coming out. They're working with Michael Bay, uh, who did Transformers and Friday the 13th, a lot of other things. See, they've actually hired him to work on the official Ouija movie that will be coming out. So um, um, I'll be probably consulting on that a little bit, which will be fun. Um, and then, you know, right now there are, I think, 16, 16 apps for the iPhone that have um, uh, Ouija-like applications. And then as well as they already, there's already three for the iPad that just was released. Um, so, you know, it definitely has hit the digital age, which is, you know, again, pretty cool for me. I'm, I'm pretty interested because I track all of that pop culture stuff. That's right. And, and what about yourself? Because uh, we're, we're down to four minutes already. It's just crazy quick. Uh, what do you have coming up in the next little while? Yeah, um, I'll be at uh, the um, Beyond Reality events, the taps people put on, um, the uh, New Hampshire Hotel. Um, so I'll be up there. I think it's April 23rd. Um, so I'll be doing that with them. And, um, yeah, just kind of traveling all around and talking. So hopefully I get up to Canada again. I'd love to do something yeah. up there. That would be awesome to have you come up here and speak. I uh, also had a person in the chat room that wanted me to give you a hello. Her name is uh, Tina Fiorda. Oh, Tina. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Okay, she's got a great story. I'm so glad she's she's on there. Um, yeah, and uh, because, uh, I actually interviewed her, her and her sister too, and uh, definitely uh, great people, and and they're advocates for the Ouija board, so they're right down your your venue there, and uh, well, their book is. We will tell her I said hello as well, and you know their their book is such a great addition uh, yeah. to the Ouija story because we haven't seen in in quite a few many years um, a, a book that's actually been dic dictated through the Ouija board and with such a positive message as their book. So, you're absolutely um, right. Yeah. Well, if you yeah. can, uh, would you like to give out uh, your website and your uh, email address one more time for the listeners there? Sure. Absolutely. If you want to reach me or learn more about me and, and kind of what I'm doing, uh, you can go to Robert Merch, M U R C H dot com. Or if you want to learn about the weekly board, uh, please go to uh, www.williamfold dot com. Um, and, you know, you can contact me right through their website or Give me a shout. I always answer the phone, too, so um, all my information is there listed on the web. All right, uh, Merch, you, you've been an absolute treat tonight, and uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. And I would love to have a secondary show with you down the road and uh, find out what's happening in the near future. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You have yourself a great night. You, too. We'll talk soon. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, that was uh, Robert Merch, Ouija board expert. Uh, just want to give a quick update uh, or info section, I should say, of my next show. Uh, it's going to be with uh, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, the great-granddaughter of former U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, that's going to be quite interesting. Uh, that will be on April 8th at 10 p.m., and I hope everyone can join me then. Today was a fantastic show. Uh, thanks to everyone that listened uh, in the chat room and those that will uh, hear this on archives. Thank you so much for your support as well. Uh, have yourself a great night. And uh, I'll see you on the other side. Take care, everybody. <laughs>